So why am I pleased to be asked to preach on this particular parable? Well, some parables, they're quite tricky and they leave us wondering exactly what Jesus means. This parable is quite easy in the sense of we know what Jesus is talking about because very helpfully he tells us what he's talking about. Um, so that makes my job a lot easier. And also this parable is about sowing and hearing the word of God, something we can all relate to at this very moment. So let me just start with a reminder on what a parable is. You may have heard it said before that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So a story would be told that people could relate to um, and that at that same time it illustrates spiritual truth. People tend to like stories. People remember stories. I could give you 20 minutes of the most theologically sound, proficient preach, the best preach you've ever heard in your lives and then give you two minutes of a story and I dare say you'd go away from here and in a week's time you'd forget the 20 minutes and you'd remember the two minute story. So stories are helpful in remembering things. In Greek, parable means uh, to cast alongside. So when Jesus speaks in parables, he's telling stories cast alongside a spiritual truth in order to point to that truth. Most parables only have one main point. We can sometimes try to find hidden meanings in things that don't exist or we tend to overthink things, which again is why this parable is so helpful because Jesus lays it out for us. But a parable should make the listener think about what's being said. At a certain point in his ministry, Jesus teaches a lot through parables. In his early ministry, it wasn't like this, but at this point in Mark, Jesus has faced massive opposition from the religious leaders. Particularly in chapter 3, just before our verses today, uh, where the religious leaders, they've accused Jesus of getting his power from Satan. As Jesus' popularity with the crowds increases, opposition from the religious leaders increases and their hearts harden. We've also just seen before the verses today that Jesus' biological family, his mothers and brothers, they're looking for him on the outside before Jesus teaches that whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. In this parable, Jesus reveals truth to those on the inside, those he considers family. A parable reveals truth, but to some it also conceals it, which we'll look at in a bit. And I also want to look at later why Jesus teaches in parables, but for now let's dig a bit deeper into the text. In verses 1 to 9, Jesus tells the parable. There's a great crowd. Jesus teaches from a boat. There's likely a few reasons Jesus taught from this location. It was away from the pressing crowds and opposition. At this point, Jesus isn't trying to make himself too well known. I also think there's an element of Jesus teaching away from the temple uh, where he could draw in passers-by who maybe wouldn't go to the temple. Jesus wanted the everyday person to be able to accept him. He wanted to be uh, available to all hearing him. The setup, it probably provided good acoustics on the water and let's be honest, it's probably just a nice setting to hear some teaching. This building is lovely but wouldn't it be nicer if we were all by the water, beautiful landscape before us. As an aside, I always get jealous when the Bible mentions Jesus sat to teach because I wish I could sit whilst preaching, partly out of laziness, but also I'm an introvert. Standing before people will always be a bit strange. But for now, we stick to tradition until I can afford to buy a boat. So Jesus tells them a story about a farmer. A lot of the crowd likely had experience with farming. They could relate to the story. For us today, unless farming is your passion, we probably don't know as much about it as back then. In the story, the farmer uses a common method of sowing. They didn't have our fancy farming machines. I'm not an expert. And so the farmer would walk across the field, throw in handfuls of seed from a large bag he'd carry on his shoulders. The plants wouldn't grow in pretty neat rows as they do with today's machines. Even the most skilled farmer back then, they'd still drop seed in places it wasn't meant to go. And the farmer sows the seed and it lands on four different areas. And as I said, the seed is the same in each place where the result is either no crop, some crop or good crop. In the end, the seed produces crops, albeit different amounts, but ultimately there is a harvest. And then in verse 9, Jesus ends the parable by saying, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And this hearing Jesus wants, it isn't like how we do a lot of our everyday hearing. 
when we have music on or the TV in the background and we're half listening, or when someone's telling us a story and we're muttering yep or uh uh-huh or nodding at when we think is the right place. Meanwhile, we're actually thinking about what we're going to have for dinner or something unrelated later on. Or for some of us, when we're distracted by our phones and half paying attention. This isn't the type of hearing Jesus wants. True hearing takes effort. This hearing means to give what's being said careful thought and then to do something about it. It means to surrender and submit to what God is saying. And afterwards, when Jesus is alone, the twelve and the others, those outside of the twelve, they come to him and they ask him about the parable. And Jesus has two responses. His second response is to say in verse 13, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? You can almost picture Jesus tired after a day of teaching. And then this group comes to him. They're embarrassed to ask him questions in front of the large crowd. So in quiet, they ask him what he meant. And he replies, you don't understand? I can imagine Peter at this point saying, I get it, but John and the others, explain it for them, Lord. And we'll look closer at the explanation in a sec, but I said Jesus had two responses, and his first response is to tell them why he teaches in parables in verses 11 and 12. So that's what I want to look at now, why Jesus teaches in parables. Jesus says, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that, and then he quotes from Isaiah 6, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. The disciples had been given the secret of the kingdom of God, i.e. they knew, or were at least learning, who the Messiah was and why he'd been sent. They were actively participating in the messianic community. They knew what it was to know God and have him rule over them. Those who didn't or don't know that, they're on the outside, the hard-hearted ones, the ones who are rejecting God. And the context around Isaiah 6 is God in the Old Testament, he tells Isaiah that people won't hear his message because their hearts are hardened. So God was going to leave them to their choice of rebellion. However, though Israel wouldn't repent and would suffer God's judgment, there would be a faithful following who would hear and know God. In his mercy and grace, God would preserve his people despite mass rebellion and rejection. These remaining believers are set apart, and Isaiah 6.13 describes this faithful remnant as the holy seed will be the stump in the land. It's like a forest ravaged by fire, leaving a single stump. And these people would be God's heirs, and the only hope of spreading his word until the ultimate everlasting hope, the word became flesh, And Jesus arrives. Both Isaiah and Jesus' teachings were rejected by hard-hearted listeners. And as I mentioned earlier in the previous chapter, Mark 3, the religious leaders, they've rejected Jesus the Messiah and they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. The religious leaders were fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy of a hard-hearted, spiritually blind people. And so in response, Jesus began teaching in parables. In using parables, Jesus would reveal truth to those who truly wanted to know it and hide it from those who rejected it. Jesus always explained the parables to the disciples. They would be his holy seed once he left the earth. The spreading of the word would be down to them. It was important that they understood. They also showed a willingness to understand. They seek the truth. And because they accepted truth from Jesus, he gave them more and more. To those willing to hear, the Holy Spirit will give spiritual discernment. The parable becomes a blessing. To those indifferent and not willing, the parable is a source of both judgment and mercy. Judgment, because for those who have hard hearts and rejected Jesus, God will leave them to their ways, which only leads to destruction. However, the parable also shows God's mercy, because there is always room for repentance. Always room to return to Jesus, to turn and be forgiven. By hiding the truth in parables, Jesus was being kind and not allowing those who rejected him to reject him even further. In verses 13 to 20, Jesus explains the parable, so let's look at that and how it applies to us. 
In verse 13, Jesus says, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And so one, this shows Jesus considers this parable is key to understanding all future parables. And two, I think this shows Jesus expected them to understand. Because the religious leaders didn't understand. His own family didn't understand. The majority of the crowds didn't understand. And even the disciples, without proper explanation, didn't understand. No matter how long you've been following Jesus, there will be things you won't understand, and that's okay. Some things will be given to us to understand, and some things we'll never know here on earth. But it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be honest before God and say, I trust you, I love you, but I don't understand. I also think by asking the disciples, how then will you understand? Jesus is hinting that even the disciples' hearts might suffer from hardening. In fact, in chapter 8 of Mark, Jesus outright asked them, are your hearts hardened? And whilst they're nothing like the Pharisees by accepting Jesus and not rejecting him, however, as we see throughout the disciples' journey with Jesus, they still lack understanding at times of who Jesus is. And so let this be a warning to us that whilst we may fully accept who Jesus is, we need to be aware of the dangers of a hard heart. So let's always be praying for soft hearts to continue seeking, knowing and understanding Jesus for who he is. And in his grace and mercy, he'll give us that. The sower in the parable is primarily Jesus, but also all those who faithfully share God's word, which is the seed, The seed is the gospel, God's message to the people. Much like a seed, the word gets planted into hearts and has potential to grow into what it was designed to be. But not every seed grows and bears fruit. The kind of soil the seed lands on makes the difference. The four soils, they represent the heart and the attitudes behind them. The soils, or the heart in the parable, they gradually increase in their receptiveness to the seed or word. The word needs to be sown. It can be read, studied, you can know and love the word, but it needs to be sown for it to grow in people's hearts. I know for me, whether it be through hearing preaches or being in lectures or having fellowship with others, when the word has been discussed is when I felt myself grow the most. Equally, when I've discipled others and had chats about the word or preached is when I've seen growth happen the most and that's not because I'm amazing I hasten to add but because the seed has been sown when seed is sown it can fall onto the path i.e hard ground due to people walking on it and it causes uh, a pathway this can represent people who hear the word but they're hardened by sin they're not bothered by the word and then the birds representing satan swoops in and they see the indifferent heart and it keeps the person from jesus Because Satan doesn't want God's word to take root and create fruitful people. Some seed falls on rocky places, sprouting quickly because there isn't much soil. And these are people, they hear the word, they receive it joyfully. But because there are no deep roots, they only last a short while. Falling away when trouble or persecution comes. And as we've prayed about today... This is, side note, this is one of many places in the Bible where we're warned trouble and persecution will come. We need to be aware that just because we're believers, it doesn't mean life will be easy. What's important in facing those difficult times is what we're rooted in, the Word and Jesus or the world, our own strength or Jesus's. The rocky place people, they're those who are initially attracted to Jesus Maybe even having encouraging starts to their journey, but when things get tough, they give up. I know someone who started coming to church, they got stuck in, they were baptised, and uh, they even started leading one of the teams at church. Unfortunately, an issue arose and it dragged them away from church, and years of what looked like quite a fruitful time were gone, because their roots likely weren't in Jesus, they were in the world. Jesus knows the word will seem appealing to some at first, but when life makes it difficult to follow Jesus, they give up. Jesus' death and resurrection is the only complete sacrifice needed to grant those who put their faith in him in Jesus' salvation. 
It's done. It's finished. There is nothing we can ever add to our salvation. But putting your faith in Jesus isn't just a one and done emotional decision. It's a growing everyday relationship with Jesus through the ups and the downs. Some seed falls on thorny ground. The word is heard, but people's concern for riches and life, uh, the worries of life, it chokes it out. The person's heart is full of the things of, the, of this world taking their attention and ultimately, ultimately leaving none for the word. And then finally, some seed falls on good, fertile ground. And this soil represents those hearts that hear the word and live out the word. Those who live out faithful lives, looking to Jesus through both good and bad, putting trust and solid roots in him. They hear the word and bear fruit. This parable shows what happens when the word is received as it should be. Something should happen. We should see fruit in people's lives. It will look different for each individual, but other people should begin to see changes and growth in someone's life after they receive Jesus. This person shows evidence of salvation by bearing fruit. Jesus' gift of salvation is more than a surface-level, joyful hearing of the word. Someone who's really received Jesus' gift of salvation will go on and show it in their life. I think it's important to add that even as fruit-bearing Christians, it's still possible to be different types of soil in your journey with him. Throughout my life, I've definitely been all four types of soil at different times. You might be producing fruit and doing really well in nearly every area of your life, but there might be a sin you're struggling with or an area of your life where you're hard soil and you haven't gave it over, to, uh, you're refusing to give it over to God. Or maybe you find yourself distracted by the busyness of life and the healthy habits you once had are no longer happening. Just because we're Christians and the seed has fell on good ground doesn't mean we can't later hear the word and have it stolen away by distractions of life. Equally, just because the seed may have fallen on one of the bad grounds doesn't mean it's permanent. It may fall on good ground later. Before I was a Christian, I would actually pray, but it was more in an OCD way. It wasn't a, a relationship. It was like a checklist of things I felt I had to say. Or I'd read the Bible, but it wouldn't really change my way of thinking. Even after becoming Christian, tithing was an area I still didn't fully understand, so I wouldn't give regularly to my church. God had my heart, but I needed to learn. And so it took wisdom in hearing from others and learning more to change in this area. And so we pray for God to reveal our hearts to him, and if there's anything we need to give over to him. This parable, it could be applied to those who preach and teach the word of God and others could dismiss it thinking, I'm not a preacher. But there's a need for all of us to spread the word because both non-believers and believers need to hear the word. We all have opportunities to sow the seed. Whether you do preach or teach in church groups or with anyone you disciple or just in everyday conversations with friends, family, colleagues, pray for opportunities to spread God's word. And you, you mentioned earlier about just one person doing the Bible study out of nine, but let it be an encouragement that numbers don't matter to Jesus. It isn't about the number of converts. The amount isn't as significant as the fruit bearing is. Sometimes we need to be patient when spreading God's word. We can think we need to see immediate results. We don't. And this parable, it sets up more to follow in the verses after this, where Jesus continues to talk about seeds growing. When seeds are sown, there is always a harvest. So let's pray to be those who not only joyfully receive God's word, but allow it to create a continuous, deep-rooted love for Jesus that makes us live out God-glorifying lives for him daily with the Holy Spirit, no matter what is happening in our life. And so let me finish. I'll pray for us now. Father, thank you that your word is true and it brings life. Thank you that you are the word become flesh. I pray you would help us all to be good soil, to be open to receiving your word, allowing it to shape us and grow us in order to bear fruit for you. Would you give us opportunities and boldness in sowing seeds to those around us and sharing you in a loving way? Help us have patience and trust in the harvest that comes with sowing seeds. 
Help us through your word and spirit to live fruit-bearing lives that point to you and your love for us. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you.